So I decided to go for the biggest system that I could physically fit on the roof of my house at the time. And we worked out that I could get 22 panels on there. So that gave me six, uh, 6,600 watts of solar. Um, and uh, that was quite a bit larger than uh, what would be considered the norm, which was about a four kilowatt system. Uh, and it did require me to get um, uh, DNO approval, um, which potentially could have been refused because it was a slightly uh, big array. Uh, and it also meant that my feed-in fit payments would be lower because my system was above uh, 4,000 watts. So obviously I generate more, but my payment per kilowatt hour I produce is, is less. Um, so that also had to be taken into account when deciding what the um, repayment window would be for a system of this size. Uh, it's not so much of a consideration now, I guess, because uh, the fit payments have all gone um, and solar's a lot cheaper than it was uh, when I had mine installed, but um, uh, it's still um, something to consider. Personally, I wanted to get as much as I could physically get, uh, and I would recommend for uh, most people go with whatever you can whatever you can fit uh, for the max um, the way things are going people will all soon have uh, electric vehicles uh, and so you know the amount of energy they can take is is vast so the more you can generate the more savings you're going to make um, so I would go for the biggest system that you can afford and that you can physically fit on, onto your roof. So on the roof I have uh, a total of 22 300 watt LG solar panels. They're the all black models they look, so they look quite nice. Not that you can see them really uh, anyway but they do look nice. Um, and those are arranged, uh, those are connected to two, two separate inverters. Uh, four of them are joined together on a string to go to a one kilowatt inverter and the rest of them are joined together in two strings to go to a five kilowatt inverter. Um, that gives me a total output of six kilowatts and there's technically uh, 6.6 .6 kilowatts of solar panels. This is quite normal. It's usual to oversize the panels to the uh, inverters. Uh, because um, very often they won't be generating their absolute peak uh, and really what you want is the inverter to be able to give you the most that it can give you most of the time. So this is my 5 kilowatt <coughs> Solar X hybrid inverter. It's both uh, an inverter and a battery charger. I also have nine 300 watt perlite panels mounted on the wall of my house, which is a south facing wall, um, and uh, that gives me another um, 2 kilowatts of solar output. Uh, technically, it's uh, 2700 watts of panels, but it's connected to a 2 kilowatt inverter. Uh, so, my total output from my inverters is 8 kilowatts. This is my one kilowatt grow watt inverter. This has four 300 watt panels connected to it in a single string, uh, but it can only only maximum output of one kilowatt. This is my two kilowatt grow watt inverter. This has nine 300 watt panels connected to it. These are my wall mounted panels, so they're in a vertical orientation. These are my Pylon Tech battery modules. Each one is 2.4 kilowatt hours of storage, 2 kilowatt hours usable, and I have five of them currently. The two at the bottom are my original two, and the three above are three new ones that I added recently. They are the same capacity even though they are smaller and that's because it's a slightly newer technology. The ones at the bottom when I bought them originally cost almost twice as much as the newer versions of the same thing above. 
So this gives me a usable storage capacity of 10 kilowatt hours. The good thing about this system is that it's modular. So, as I said, initially I only had two of them uh, because that's all I could afford at the time. But then as time went by and funds allowed, I was able to add to my system just one at a time and you just plug them in and away you go. Uh, it, it just means that um, you don't have to stump up all the money up front for a large battery like for example the Tesla Powerwall uh, where it's going to cost you sort of five or six grand to, um, to purchase one of those. Each of these battery modules is probably about 800 pounds each so you know, as I said when, when funds allow I can, I can put another 800 pounds in and add some more capacity uh, as and when I want. So I think that's a really good and flexible system. So behind this panel is my distribution board and in here I have this large changeover switch. So what happens is if the grid goes down normal grid tied systems will all go off but my system allows it to work in an off grid mode so if the grid power goes down I can click this switch that disconnects the second circuit in my house from the grid entirely and then I can run it off of the uh, solar and batteries directly even though there's no power coming in from the grid. And what I also do is because this circuit can work in that way I, I tend to have this disconnected from the grid all the time. Uh, and I'm running it in an off-grid mode using the batteries from my shed uh, and uh, in that way the rest of the batteries that I have only have to handle this circuit of the house which is things like the kitchen, the fridge, the freezer, that sort of thing. This circuit mainly is the downstairs and upstairs sockets and the lights. So this is my system as it stands at the moment. I'm going to be expanding it in the next couple of weeks by adding uh, a kilowatt or so of solar panels to the roof of my power shed. That will be connected to my five kilowatt off-grid inverter. And I'm also going to be adding another one of the Pylon Tech modular batteries to my system to give me a total of 12 kilowatt hours of usable storage. I'll also soon be starting work on another recycled laptop battery pack for my power shed. Um, this should bring my capacity there up to 16 kilowatt hours of storage. So stay tuned for all of this, it'll be coming up in future videos. So this is my MPP solar 5 kilowatt off grid inverter. Uh, as the name says, it's off-grid, it's not grid-tied like the other ones in the house. So this one works uh, supplying a circuit with power from either the batteries here or from the solar panels, which I haven't bought yet. Um, that's coming in a future video, so stay, stay around for that. Um, so yeah. Um, when it can't get power from solar or from the batteries, it can run from a generator. In this case, the generator is the grid. So when these run out, it automatically switches over and starts supplying the circuit from, from the grid. Uh, it can also charge the batteries from the grid. So what I can do is when I have excess solar going in the house and the house batteries are full and I start exporting, I can switch this on to charge and it pulls power from the grid to charge these batteries and so I managed to keep even more of my generated electricity. Um, once I get the solar panels installed on the roof of the shed then they will charge these batteries and I can charge from the grid at the same time so um, it should allow me to capture as much as possible. Um, and obviously this circuit runs the second circuit as I showed in the house uh, so if there is a power cut, this is completely independent from the grid and it will continue to supply the lights and the household sockets. These are my two EVSE car chargers. This one is set up to do 16 amps or 3.6 kilowatts. 
this one set up to do 32 amps or 7.2 kilowatts. However, both of our cars only can charge at 3.6 kilowatts. So even with both of these going, we're only pulling 32 amps max. If you want to know more about these open source car chargers, uh, have a look at one of my previous videos where I uh, got one of these delivered and built it. These open source chargers allow you to vary the amount of charge by sending MQTT messages to the unit. So you can set it to be anything between 32 amps right down to just 6 amps. Uh, and it's this mechanism that I use with my system in order to vary the amount of power going to the car depending on how much solar is left available. So these are our two EVs. We have uh, an original Nissan Leaf which has done about 80,000 miles now and still going strong. And um, we have a Mitsubishi Highlander Outlander <laughs> Highlander Outlander PHEV. Um, technically that's a plug-in hybrid but my commute to work is only six miles each way so I actually only ever use it on electric mode. The engine never starts up except to uh, process a bit of fuel to stop it going off every now and then. This is my hot water tank. I replaced it um, a few years back so that I could try to absorb as much spare energy into it as I could when there was sun going spare. Uh, so it has a traditional coil which comes off the normal heating system but it also has two immersions. So that means if I have more than 6,000 watts going spare I can dump 6,000 watts into here all at once. Over here in the corner the switch is uh, uh, an off-grid option that I have within my system that allows me to run one of the circuits in the house um, in an off-grid fashion. So I can select between the inverter that's in the shed or the Solax inverter here whenever uh, it uh, detects that the grid is down it goes into a emergency power supply mode which means it can um, run one of the circuits in the house as long as it's disconnected uh, from the mains of the grid. This is to prevent backfeed onto the line to protect engineers who might be working on, a, on the system in a power cut. Up here is my Raspberry Pi. This runs my um, home automation software. Um, it talks to each of these inverters, um, reads their data, stores it so that I can plot graphs. It also allows me to switch on and off devices as and when uh, there's spare solar going. This includes uh, adapting the amount of energy going into the car charger, um, switching on and off the immersion, uh, the dishwasher, that sort of thing. The other thing the uh, Raspberry Pi does is it monitors the temperature here in this understairs cupboard because obviously there's a lot of equipment in here that all generates a lot of heat. Um, and it monitors the temperature and if it detects that the temperature is getting slightly too high it switches on these couple of fans in the floor which suck air in from the underfloor uh, which is a suspended floor for the house so that's vented to the outside so effectively it's pulling in cool air from outside into this cupboard which uh, helps to keep the temperature in here down uh, it, the warm air rises up to the top of the cupboard um, and there's another fan at the top of the cupboard that blows the air out into one of the rooms of the house. Um, and this just helps to, uh, uh, in the winter months, add a little bit of uh, free warm air heating. So, as I mentioned, the Raspberry Pi is running some software that uh, I wrote myself called Monocle. This software talks to all of my inverters as well as my car chargers, uh, fans, temperature sensors um, and various household plugs. It does this using a protocol called MQTT. My software gives me the ability to set up rules to switch on and off devices at various power levels depending on the amount of solar available. 
I use my system to try and make the most of my electricity by setting up rules that use the energy when it's available and don't use it when it's not available. It maximizes my self-use and minimizes my pull from the grid. Monocle records all the data and gives me the ability to plot graphs going back years so I can compare one year to another year or one month to a, the same month in a previous year and I can interrogate my data in virtually any way I see fit from the amount of times a device switched on and off in a day the total amount of energy it used the capacity of my batteries now, the amount of energy that's gone into the batteries the amount of energy that's come out I can also work out the degradation if I want to I can plot graphs of the temperature of the inverters of the batteries of the cupboard where they're all housed of my shed of the car chargers it really is a very flexible system and I can really interrogate it in just about any way I see fit so if there's any kind of data that you would like to see plotted let me know in the comment section below and I'll do my best to produce it if there's anything else about my setup that you would um, like to know then uh, please leave a comment below and uh, I'll try and answer them um, and uh, please like share and subscribe to my channel um, and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers.